Boxes Day today, and we've been talking about that all morning. It's so important, actually, we agree... Yes. ..that we, that we recognise our armed forces more, uh, whether you're serving and or a veteran. Maybe not on one, just one day a year. Yeah. But it's better than nothing. It is. For now. Um, let's talk to Minister of State for Security, Tom Tugendhat, who joins us now. Um, Good morning to you. It's it's interesting when we talk about Armoured Forces Day and about everything that that uh, the big parties want to do for the veterans and and for and for serving personnel. The problem you've got as the, as the party in government is that people will say, well, whatever you pledge, why haven't you done it earlier? Well, Stephen, look, I'm with Anne on this. Actually, I think uh, Armed Forces Day for those of us who are veterans isn't just one day a year. It, you know, we live with our service, good and bad. Uh, throughout the year, and for some of us that can be bring back painful memories, but it can also bring back huge moments of pride of having served alongside some of the best that our country has to offer. And your point, Stephen, is entirely fair, but look at the record. Look at what Johnny Mercer has achieved as the Minister for Veterans Affairs, and look at what the Prime Minister has achieved in creating that Cabinet position for Veterans Affairs. We've got Op Resolute and Op Courage that help veterans who may be finding life just a little bit difficult at the moment, and we've also got the Northern Ireland Legacy Bill, which ends vexatious prosecutions of people like Dennis Hutchins. Now, GB News was absolutely brilliant in supporting us through that, uh, because that's been a really difficult moment for many people in the in the armed forces community, seeing Dennis in his dying days, very sadly, in 2021, being persecuted and prosecuted for the God knows how many of time after he'd already answered all the questions so many times. Now, we've introduced the Northern Ireland Legacy Bill, and Sir Keir Starmer wants to uh, repeal it. Now, that I just think that's wrong. And so this is a really clear choice about our future, not just about today, but about the future for veterans in the UK. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if you worry for your job as well, even if um, even if you don't uh, you're, you don't have it uh, on Friday next Friday morning. Do you worry that uh, an incoming Labour government might actually do away with a minister for the armed forces? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I, look, they've <clears throat> made it very clear they don't want a cabinet minister for veterans affairs. We're the only party that's committed to it, and I think it's incredibly important that anybody, whoever they are, who seeks to lead this fantastic country of ours commits to caring and being there for our veterans. I think that's really important. The other uh, Five Eyes nations have it. Why shouldn't the United Kingdom? Well, Keir Starmer clearly disagrees. He thinks British veterans aren't worth as much. But he says, um, uh, I mean, John Healy, who we've just been talking to, says, well, you know, what Labour would do is, is cement the Armed Forces Covenant into law. Well, the Armed Forces Covenant is already in operation, but that's not enough. We introduced that because it's a way of making sure that businesses and councils and other people across the United Kingdom are absolutely uh, aware of what their responsibilities are and their, their, their commitment should be to armed forces veterans. And I think that's really important. But what's also important is that central government sees its responsibility clearly. And I'm afraid over many, many years, we have seen that the MOD, quite rightly, is focused on fighting today's wars. That's exactly what we want them to be focused on. They need to be getting our servicemen and women ready for whatever challenges come at us, whether it's Putin uh, threatening us in the East or uh, Iran in the Middle East. You know, we need to be absolutely ready. We need somebody else. We need a, an Office of Veterans Affairs to make sure we're caring for those who have served, because this is an ongoing legacy. It's not about fighting today's wars, but it is about bringing together everybody from housing and health care and even education to make sure that veterans are properly cared for. And I'm afraid Labour doing away with that is making a very clear statement as to what they think veterans are for. Veterans are there to fight a war and then be forgotten. And so many of our viewers are, are emailing in and saying that at the moment they just see a country where we appear to treat illegal immigrants better than our veterans. You've got veterans sleeping on the streets while m immigrants and migrants are in hotels, costing the country a fortune. Um, and, and that's I'm, ongoing, isn't it? No, I'm going to have to correct you there, Anne, because actually that's one of the things that Johnny has achieved. The Office for Veterans Affairs had made sure that no uh, for veteran is sleeping rough who doesn't have access to a place. Now, for various personal reasons, occasionally one or two 
maybe. But all of them have access to a place if they wish it. And Johnny has been absolutely clear about this. This is what he's been literally devoting the last few years to, and he's done a brilliant job. Now, as I say, there's a lot still to do, but Op Resolution, Op Courage, that he has led, has brought together cross-government working groups, it's brought together councils, it's brought together uh, the devolved administrations across the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales, and it's made a huge difference. So, you know, this is exactly why the Office of Veterans Affairs matters so much and why I'm so worried for fellow veterans if Labour get in, because they're saying they're going to do away with it. As you say, that, that's all focused on um, our veterans and not on the wars of today. However, we've got to focus on, the, on the, the conflicts that we're facing at the moment, the instability in the world, and the fact that our armed forces seem to be... Uh, I mean, the personnel <coughs> numbers are way down, frankly. And, I mean, most people would be absolutely gobsmacked if they realised just how few people we have serving, never mind the, the lack of equipment that, that, that these men and women have to deal with as well. And that has been under your watch. So, look, Stephen, I think there's a huge amount of improvement that we must make. And I'm, that's why I'm, you know, I've been arguing consistently for a higher defence budget, as you know very well. When I uh, was arguing only a few years ago uh, that we needed to make sure that we were raising our uh, defence budget to meet the challenges that we face. Because, you know, let's be clear, the threat from Putin in Ukraine isn't just about Ukraine, it's about us, it's about our eastern border, it's about making sure that we are safe. Standing with NATO is about protecting the British people, not about anybody else. And that's why I'm absolutely delighted that we've committed already to 2.5% by 2030. Is it the final number? No, it isn't, but it is the right target. And what we need to be doing is investing in the kind of kit and equipment that will really transform wars. Look at what's going on in Ukraine. You've seen people with really sort of the kind of drones that you might buy from Amazon, transforming them into battle-winning assets. And that's where we need to be adapting and overcoming. And I've seen some really remarkable innovations out of the MOD in recent years. I've seen some really important changes. And the work done by James Cartledge in transforming procurement has been hugely important. We've seen far too much waste in defence procurement over many years. And the changes that we're making make it more efficient and give us more battle-winning assets much quicker. That is a huge change. If, uh, if the general election doesn't go your way uh, and you end up either in opposition or wherever, will you remain in politics? Uh, I'm intending to serve the people of Tunbridge for as long as they'll have me. Uh, you know, that's up to them, I'm afraid, Anne, and we'll, we'll have to see what they choose to do in a week's time. But I am absolutely committed to standing up for our country in any way that I possibly can. I've spent, look, I spent uh, the best part of now, I suppose, it's about 22, 23 years serving our country in public life as a soldier first and then in politics. And I'm absolutely committed to making sure our country is the safest, most prosperous, happiest place to live. And there's a huge amount to do. But this is a fantastic country. We have so many good things. We have an amazing health service. We have fantastic people, amazing education opportunities. And that's driving such change. Just look at the comparisons. We have the biggest tech startup scene in Europe. You know, some of our cities have more tech startups than whole countries in Europe. This is a massive, massive country with huge possibilities before us. And I am committed to making us the best country in the world.